food production chain is a remarkably fragile ecosystem. The supply side, farming, is being stressed by increasingly volatile climate conditions. On the front end, demand is soaring with an ever-growing global population. The World Bank estimates that we'll need to produce 50% more food by the year 2050 to feed a global population of 9 billion. Simply put, the current food production math doesn't work. At MIT, an engineer turned urban farmer is combining modern technology with traditional farming to potentially usher in the future of food production. I'm Ryan Duffy, and this is Now What? Zach Stuller is a citrus farmer in the San Joaquin Valley of Central California. Over the past five years, he's seen his crop devastated by the effects of California's ongoing drought. So Zach, where are we right now? Um, we're, in the, we're in the middle of a, a dead orchard. We have a certain amount of water to, to farm with and, and we have a certain amount of acres that we, we farm and, and um, we don't have enough water to farm all those acres, so something's gotta get cut. We wanna grow everything we can, but Times are tough and there's just not enough water. What would these trees be growing if they were? Nectarines. Nectarines. The ramifications of a decision like this to, to let this land go, essentially, it's, it's is a huge, it's staggering. A, it's a huge economic decision. I mean, this is 160 acres essentially off the market that doesn't go to somebody's hand or mouth. The climate is changing on this planet. All you have to do is look to the west. California is experiencing a drought over the last five years. If you're relying on the weather patterns for your livelihood and that changes, you're out of luck. The whole system is in a state of flux, so it makes it much more difficult for farmers to make intelligent decisions when everything is changing. There's just higher variance now in, in terms of climate effects, and if those ripple effects start happening around the world, it strikes me that, that we're potentially poised for, for catastrophe. Correct. The irony, of course, is that the volatile growing conditions are in part a product of man's impact on the environment, an impact that's worsened by the carbon emissions that result from transporting food all across the globe. Currently, the food system looks like this. 7.2 billion people need the size of South America to supply their food. The population is increasing, so in another 20 years or 30 years, it might be 9 billion people. In order for them to be fed, these extra two to three billion people will need the size of Brazil in addition to what we already have. If you look around the world, there isn't the size of Brazil left to farm. This will be historically a new era we're moving into of food scarcity and rising food prices. So over the last 10,000 years, we have created a system which is unsustainable. We know we have a ton of people on the planet. We know we're using resources at a somewhat alarming pace. We know that the quality of food available, the nutrient density quality has gone down. We have to come up with something else. Caleb Harper is a research scientist at MIT's Media Lab and the inventor of the food computer, a device he hopes will be a revolutionary new approach to agriculture. The food computer is an idea about taking a greenhouse and then putting a computer on the side. And that computer has a brain. And so that brain can analyze what's going on inside of the little greenhouse and then make changes over time. The easiest way to think about it is we have the box and imagine that Mexico climate is in that box. Whatever atmospheric conditions that grow really great strawberries. And you're like, I want this Mexican strawberry, but I live in Boston. So what we try to do is take the climate of Mexico we record that and we create a plant recipe. And think of it like a library full of books. You pull that digital book down, you load it into the software, and no matter where you are in the world, that climate begins again. I went to visit Caleb at MIT and get inside, both figuratively and literally, the food computer. So this world is perfect for the plants, right? right? We're in plant heaven right now. Right. These plants are getting all of the, the good kind of light that they need. They're getting access to water all the time. Plants like to be stable. Sure. When the environment changes, the plant also like reacts. And it's like, oh my gosh, what's coming next? I'm gonna shut down. Yeah. And I'm gonna shut down until the climate gets good again. And I'm gonna start growing again. Right. So in here, it's like pedal to the metal. So 
from here to here yep. in two weeks yep. is, I'd imagine, faster than yeah. the natural world. Yeah. Is that uh, fair to say? Totally. So like this method is running anywhere between three and four times faster. A head of lettuce that might take us 60 to 90 days, yeah. maybe we're getting in 15 to 17 days. Right. Growing a lot faster, using a lot less resource, because when we use water in that lab, it's constantly recirculating. We don't lose any to groundwater, we don't lose any to surface runoff, so we can get into using between 50 and 70% less water than conventional farming. We're using this technique, which is aeroponics, right? So if you get down here, oh, wow. right? So there's no soil and there's no standing water and what happens is just mist fills this box. In addition to using fewer natural resources, the food computer also consolidates the supply chain. Growing food in the same place you're eating food is better by really any metric. It means that food doesn't lose nutrients during the packaging and preserving process. It means price tags don't need to account for all that costly shipping. And perhaps most importantly, it eliminates the environmental impact caused by transporting food all across the world. So we're sending our food these long distances. They're getting less nutrient availability along that supply chain, and they're producing carbon emission. My job or my vision is to take that world and replace it with little wireless signals. Like I'm sending you a climate recipe, you're on the other side receiving it, and you're able to produce the exact same food that I can. The idea for the food computer was inspired by a trip Caleb took to Japan shortly after the Fukushima disaster. What he saw was a land devastated by both environmental and nuclear contamination, as well as a population genuinely afraid of the food being grown there. He became convinced there had to be a better way to control the process of food production. After that experience, I got home to the lab, created a, a funny little box, and I killed everything. So I started asking people for help. I put out a bulletin for students, and I said, do you want to build the real Farmville? And I got a ton of response. Bunch of young students, because they're all interested in food now. Let's just pop, Let's that, just let's rip pop it off. that off, yeah. and then we'll just probe directly to it. Cool. So the food computer really sits kind of halfway between super complex and, and really actually pretty simple. The concept and potential impact is huge and massive and involves a convergence of factors, but the component parts are really simple. They're ordered on Amazon and bought at Bed Bath & Beyond and rigged together by some kids. It's truly a perfect example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. We've probably built 10 different versions of the food computer in two or three months. And so right now I have basically a shop full of elves. I am one of the elves. And we are building these machines out because if we tried to wait for someone else to do it, Right? It would take forever. So we have a little factory turned on. We're building these things, we're putting them out, and we're testing them. We just got through testing all the actuators. Okay. So like turning on the humidifier yeah. and all that. Oh, look at that. It's, uh, Gotta love things with LEDs. Yep, yep. There are three big food computers we call food server, about the size of a shipping container farm. There's one here in the Media Lab. Uh, there's one in Guadalajara, Mexico. And there's one in East Lansing, Michigan. The smaller personal food computer I just put out this week, so it's the first time the world's seen it. There are about six of them existing in local schools in Boston, uh, grades seven through 12. We're here at Charlestown Public High School outside of Mr. Hayes' science class, where Caleb is teaching a whole group of high school students about food computers. Essentially think of this as a greenhouse and this as a computer. So the, it's a computer controlled greenhouse. We call it a food computer. This is just something that, it, our team's been working on for a little while, and we genuinely want to see what you guys think. Any other questions at all? Say we was messing around with this, and I found something like, you know, to help you or whatever, like, we yeah. just tell y'all, and y'all put it into the final touches of, like, the big finale type thing. We're gonna document that, put it on our Wikipedia page, and it'll have your name next to it as the contributor. Oh, so, yeah? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's how open source works. So Big Ag will never share its secrets with the public. Why? Because it's proprietary knowledge. In order to democratize the indoor food industry, the way in which the food is grown indoors has to be shared. How do we reach a networked effect with agriculture? When you see companies like Wikipedia killing Britannica, what is that version for agriculture? He's releasing this information to the general public for public use. And I think that's 
a remarkable step in the right direction. So the food computer is not salvation in a box, but what it is is a potentially transformative new tool. You know, you think 30, 40 years ago, the personal computer was this big, weird, foreign object people didn't want in their house, and now I don't leave my apartment without one in my pocket. The food computer's kind of at that precipice, right? It's a new personalized approach to a basic human need, and when you see it in a classroom like this, it kind of feels like the start of something. We need a system change. The system change doesn't mean getting rid of the last system. It means taking the last system and making adjustments, making new little adaptations to create the next generation of farmer. There will always be outdoor farms. But I think that commercial farming on a large scale has a finite lifespan ahead of it. Urban farming, that's the future. We're living in the age of the unintended consequence. And it's an environmental consequence and it's a human consequence. The time to raise the issue was five, 10 years ago. You know, this is the time for solution. Caleb's point is hard to argue. Global population and climate volatility are rising hand in hand. We're already stressing the existing food production infrastructure to its limits. So we might be wise to start looking in some unexpected places. Maybe even to a group of MIT misfits who are trying to put the world's climate in a box.